you have your Bibles with you, if you'd like to turn to <coughs> Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. <coughs> and uh, this morning we are, well, I say we're moving into a, one of our new preaching series. Actually, it's following on immediately from one of our former preaching series. The, the series we did on the Beatitudes um, and then the link bit is now being followed by the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, Keith and I have the joy of producing this one. It was supposed to be him this morning, but if you've spoken to him, you'll realize he's got no voice. So we've swapped. <laughs> now the aim of this series is to help us understand the challenge that was put to us at the end of the last one, when we talked about Jesus fulfilling the law rather than abolishing it. And the, the last verse we read was in chapter five and verse 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that is quite a challenge. And obviously I'm assuming that the reason you're here this morning is because you do want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not just as in go to heaven when you die, but actually to become a citizen of that kingdom here and now. So that on the day when finally we see the earth renewed and the kingdom of heaven expressed on the earth, we're actually ready to be part of that. And so the aim of this is to understand some of the teaching Jesus gave us on what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, one of the first things is realizing that we won't be able to do it in our own strength. So we're going to read this morning um, from verses 21 to 30 of chapter five. And this, this is um, two instances of Jesus um, saying, you've heard what it said before, now I'm telling you this. So verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you'll never get out until you have paid the last penny. And you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Let me just clarify, this teaching is given to Jesus' disciples. It's not what he's preaching to the people who, who didn't want to hear him. This is preaching to people who want to be part of his kingdom, teaching them what it means to come and be a citizen of that place. So it is speaking to people whose hearts have already been renewed by the Holy Spirit, who have been born again, who know that a, a radical change has taken place in their whole outlook on life and their whole goal for life. And they want to be like him. And this is the teaching that Jesus is giving to his disciples. 
So it is relevant for us, and interestingly, some of it you might have thought, well, of course a Christian isn't going to do these things, are they? But it has been known. And so one of the first things we need to get hold of is going back to the beginning of our last series, blessed are those who know that they are spiritually poor, the poor in spirit. You become one of the blessed ones when you know how desperately you need his resources and his grace, because in yourself, you haven't got it. If you haven't come to that point, you haven't even started on the path of discipleship yet. It is only when we come to the end of our own resources and open ourselves to the resources that only are available in Jesus that there is the possibility of this kind of radical change. Now it's interesting, as we mentioned at the end of the last series, you know, that um, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law. So although we get in free because of what Jesus has done for us, it doesn't mean that now murder and adultery have suddenly become acceptable. And I think we all understand that that is actually right and good, and we would all agree with it, yes? But you notice when Jesus says this, now you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder or you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, now notice he speaks here with authority. He is speaking with the authority of the one who is the son of God, the one who is actually the one behind the original commands. And he, when he says, but I say to you, he says, now I'm saying something more to you here and I'm saying it with authority. And if you're gonna be my disciple, you need to listen to what I'm saying, not just what the scribes and the Pharisees have been saying about how to kind of, um, well, narrow it down to something that's reasonably manageable. No, when I speak to you, says Jesus, I'm, spoken, I'm giving you something which in your own strength is not manageable. I think most of us have probably managed to refrain from committing murder. Clive and I both know quite a few people who have committed murder from his previous um, job in, the, in Whitemore Prison. But actually, probably most people in this room haven't committed murder, and I won't ask about adultery because, you know, that might be a more possible one. But the reality is that those are things which, with a bit of self-control, we could all manage not to do. So it might just be possible, even if you were very tempted. But Jesus says, I'm not just talking about the final horrible action. I'm talking about the causes that underlay that. We're going deeper, as we said, with when it comes to his approach to the law. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm interested in the root, not just the fruit. Many years ago, I had a sudden urge to do some gardening. My husband will tell you that is not something that happens to me very often. But in our garden at the time, we had some bushes and some rose trees, um, and there was a plant growing up which kept sort of winding round and strangling them all. It was a bit like bindweed, only bigger. And this particular thing, it, was, it had big leaves and it was spoiling everything. And we'd had several attempts at pulling it out, but of course it's wound round, very difficult. And this particular day, I thought, I'm gonna get that. So I've, I'm following it round to finally find where it came out of the ground. And I don't, can't remember what the plant is called even. And I dug down and dug down and dug down. And eventually I got to its root. And you know, the root was like a huge parsnip. And yet the stem was thin and the leaves were, were broad. But the root was a huge parsnip. And until I dug that root out, the wretched thing kept growing again and again and again, however much you pulled it off. So Jesus is saying, if we want to get to the stage where we have people for whom murder and adultery are no longer issues, you've got to deal with the root. See, have you ever heard somebody say, I just saw red? I've heard people say that. And it's an excuse to justify having behaved in an angry and violent way. 
but it doesn't justify your sin because you didn't just see red when before everything was fine. That's what happens when you've got to the way past the root stage and past the, um, the shooting stage, you've actually got to the fruit stage. Or have you ever heard some people say, well, the thing is, we just couldn't help it. This thing was bigger than both of us. Tosh. <laughs> that is a seed which has been planted and has taken root and has become a shoot and has now flourished into a fruit. And Jesus says, if you want to get rid of the poisonous fruit, deal with it at the root. In other words, he says, he who's nursing anger against his brother, that is the seed of murder. When we are resentful and jealous, uh, when somebody has upset us, when we feel that we've been put down, sidelined, under reasonable demands are being made of us, or my demands are not being met. That's often one of the roots. We have to start identifying the root. Otherwise, it'll grow into the fruit. Now, says Jesus, well, we all know that if you commit murder and you're caught, you will be in court and you will be joining some of those others who are in Clive's Bible study in, right, in Whitemore and such like places, or in some other countries, you may find yourself on the end of a rope, as would have been the case in this country when I was still a child. But here, Jesus is saying, you need to understand there are consequences even when you start planting the root. He says, actually, it's not just the one who's committed murder who's liable to judgment. He says, actually, when you're nursing resentment and hatred and bitterness and letting that take part, you're going to come under judgment because that's sin. Because actually, you are, you are treating your brother as somebody less important than you. You are belittling him. You're treating him as somebody who merely exists as a nuisance or a pest or a, or a problem to you and you want rid of him. That's the seeds of murder. Even if you don't get to the point of actually murdering him, you feel, I wish, oh, I wish he was dead. I wish he wasn't here at least. And there you see that. It's that attitude towards a person who is made in God's image for God's purpose and who is equally in need of the grace and mercy that Jesus has paid for with his own blood. Just as I am and you are. But if instead of dealing with that root, we start brooding on it and letting it grow and letting our resentment or our jealousy or whatever it is, then we begin to find it starts coming out in the way we speak. Now, it says in this translation, whoever insults his brother. Now, the word that is used insults there, it's, it liter literally, in Aramaic, the word was, says raka to his brother. And the word raka in Aramaic, which is the language they spoke in, Je in Galilee, so it's the language Jesus grew up speaking in day-to-day -day life. Raka means empty head, idiot, nitwit, dimwit. You're insulting his intelligence. You're suggesting he's got no brain. He must be dim and insulting because he doesn't agree with me. And, you know, obviously, if he had any brain, he would know that I'm right. If he had intelligence, he would see the point of what I'm saying and agree with me. So, therefore, I'm dismissing him. Oh, he's an empty head. The guy's dim, stupid. You're insulting his intelligence. And Jesus says, well, there are going to be consequences for that. You might not actually be caught, held up in court, although these days you might. It could happen. 
the way society is currently going, it will be actually perhaps that you might even find yourself in court because somebody felt insulted by what you said. But the attitude which demeans someone else and dismisses them as dim because they just don't agree with you, that, says Jesus, is going to bring you before God's counsel, even if it doesn't bring you before man's. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, that, that is really serious. Now, when we say fool, we probably mean dimwit, nitwit, or whatever. But actually, in Scripture, if you read the book of Proverbs in particular and, and elsewhere, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This is a heart issue. You're basically accusing your brother of being someone who is in rebellion against God. You're accusing him of a, of a, a defect in his character here. You're suggesting that he's a lost cause. You're, in, you're actually insulting his character. And it's uh, somebody I read, oh yes, a man called Mr. Tasker. Is basically warning us that. Um, hello. <laughs> Modern technology. Eh? Yes. Um, let me just get my focus back there. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tasker, that's right. He says, "Geez, in." If you understand that, if you understand that according to the Bible, the fool is the person who lives like he's accountable to nobody, including God. He makes his own rules, does it his own way, thinks what he thinks, decides what's good and bad, and he regards himself as not having to account to anybody else. So basically, he's somebody who's decided there is no God. As far as I'm concerned, I'm God. And... And so when you say to somebody, you fool, you're effectively saying, you're going to hell. And Jesus says, whoever says to his brother, you fool, is in danger of hellfire. In other words, says Mr. Tasker, Jesus would be saying that the man who tells his brother that he's doomed to hell is in danger of hell himself. Because can you see what he's done? He's judged in a way that only God can. He has passed judgment on the condition of his brother's heart and motives, which he can't see. You can see the actions. And obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, we condone sinful actions. But you cannot see into another person's heart. You don't know what has made the person they are. You don't know what their inner motives are. You don't know why they are as they are. You are not in a position to judge him. Just as if I've ever looked deeply into my own heart, I'm aware that there's a lot there that's worthy of judgment. And I trust in God for mercy. And I'm not in a position to decide that somebody else is less worthy than me and doesn't deserve that. So that's why Jesus says you need to deal with your attitude to that person. And you need to realize that that person matters to God. And so you need to learn to make them matter to you as well. You can't just dismiss them. A similar principle goes when it comes to the adultery thing. Again, it's in the root. That's why Jesus uses this very dramatic phrase, you know, sort of, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Or if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. In other words, deal with this radically. Now, he is not suggesting we mutilate ourselves. There is a quite well-known um, early Christian scholar called Oregon who actually took this literally and castrated himself. Shortly after that, the Council of Nicaea 
laid down a rule that that was not to be permitted, that was to be forbidden. This is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying mutilate yourself, but he is saying you need to mortify your flesh. In other words, put it to death. And he uses this very radical language to get through to us, folks, this is serious. It's not just a little matter. This is a big thing. It's a big root, and it will produce some incredibly poisonous fruit. So deal with it, and deal with it radically, he says. Now, you notice the, the solution that Jesus gives in both these instances um, for the person who's struggling with the attitude to his brother that could have ended in murder if left to run its full course, he says, so when you're going to give your gift at the altar, in other words, when you're reaching up to God, coming to worship, and then you suddenly remember, ah, oh, my brother is offended with me. There's an issue unresolved. What he's saying is that is more important than going through the motions of religious observance. You need to prioritize putting right the relationship and you need to do it now. Don't leave it till later. And if somebody is so upset with you that you know they might be actually taking you to court, you, you find yourself in trouble, well again he's saying, if you've got any sense, the consequences are now looming Deal with it quickly. And that's what he says, start now. Sort out the relationships now because your relationship with other people matters to God and it needs to be a priority before you start coming to God and saying, oh, here I am worshipping. The whole world can see. Now, you might think for a Christian it shouldn't be necessary. I think Clive has mentioned him before. He knows somebody He's, a, he's not of this nationality, although he's in this country. He was the pastor of a church, quite a big church. Clive met him in Whitemore because he killed his wife. You need to deal with things radically and you need to deal with things now, not leave them till later. And with adultery, nip it in the bud start with what you're looking at and then what your imagination's doing that's where you need to be digging out the root because what, what you're looking at what you're imagining and you know the person who is the object of those fantasies is just that you have made them an object for your pleasure and satisfaction you have demeaned them as a person created in the image of God with all the dignity of a child of God, somebody who matters to him. And you've reduced them to something that was just there for your pleasure. We need to understand this, that the marriage relationship, including the sacramental expression of it, is something which God has created as holy. He designed it. It's not our idea, and so it's not up to us to set the terms. He designed it. And what he designed is good and holy and is based, if it's the way God does it, on self-sacrificial, self-giving and love for the benefit of the other which is very different from just satisfying my personal appetite. So, this is pretty challenging. Let's face it, is there anybody in this room who can get up and say, no, fine, I've got all that sorted. I'm a finished work. Well, please tell us your secret. But remember, this is Jesus talking. So it isn't Oh, well, so we can put that aside now because actually it's impossible. It's an ideal to aim for, but let's face it, we all know we're going to fall so far short that we might as well give up now. No, it is teaching given to Jesus' disciples who have been born again by his spirit and have therefore been given the resources 
to live the life he calls us to live, the power to do what by ourselves we can't do, the ability and the strength in him when we are poor enough in spirit to lean solely on that and when we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, as Paul says, you know, he who is led by the Spirit of God is a son of God. It means that the heart is being sorted and the rest will follow. It's a progressive experience. It doesn't all just happen with one quick flash overnight. But as we yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we are changed because our motive is different now. And God is able to make us able. He has the power, but he is a lover. He does not force that power on us. He values the response of our heart, what God wants. It's not primarily our service, our work, our bright ideas or whatever. He wants our hearts. He wants us to love him. And when we love him, we begin to love the people he loves because we begin to see them through his eyes. And when with all our hearts we want his kingdom, and like I was saying that last sermon, you know, when, when his law is written on our hearts so that actually we delight in his law, then we find that's the direction I want to go and so that is the direction I do go. And when I slip up, that's the direction I repent and go back to. And one day, when the kingdom is fully come, I will be totally at home in it. Because my heart is set to embrace the values of his kingdom. We hear a lot these days about embracing British values. There's a, quite a lot of disagreement as to what the traditional British values actually are. And some of us who've lived a lot of decades have kind of seen some changes in what traditional British values are. But the point being that um, if you're going to live in a country and be at home in it, you have to embrace its values. If we want to be citizens in God's kingdom with Jesus as our king, we need to embrace his values. And as we embrace them and set our hearts on them, he, by the power of his spirit, with our cooperation, will work that into us until one day when we stand in the new heavens and the new earth, seeing him face to face, completely transformed into his likeness, we will feel totally at home. <laughs>